Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, today, I, I hope it doesn't catch you too off guard, today is the first Sunday of Advent. I know we just finished Thanksgiving, but this uh, is the first Sunday of Advent, so uh, welcome. Uh, it is uh, great to be here. If you're visiting with us, we're glad for uh, your visit with us. Uh, welcome to Emmanuel. By way of uh, announcements, just want to continue to remind us of a few uh, health guidelines. Uh, first, and, first of all, while we're indoors, we do need to continue to wear masks. Uh, after our worship service, we ask that you would exit all the way out to the parking lot. We do want to fellowship with one another, uh, but we could do that best in the parking lot after our worship service uh, this morning. Uh, there are some sanitation uh, places in the hallway uh, that you can use uh, if you need hand sanitizer, just as ways of continuing to follow sort of health guidelines in this season. Uh, by way of announcement, uh, if you look at your bulletin on page 16, you'll find uh, many of those. You just want to draw your attention to a couple. Uh, first, you will receive an invitation this week to a Christmas drive through And so there will be an opportunity on the 13th, Sunday the 13th, starting at 4.30 uh, in the afternoon. Uh, we'll have an opportunity... 4.30 or 4? Four? 4, sorry. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, reaching out to everyone in our church community, but uh, perhaps in particular to those uh, who are unable to join us yet on a Sunday morning, uh, an opportunity to come through in a, in a drive-through format uh, and have some Christmas caroling and some things of that nature. So just pay attention to that. Mark your calendars for the 13th of December. There are opportunities to serve if you'd like a job. And so uh, you can see me or email the church office about opportunities to serve with that event. There is no youth Bible study tonight since it is Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, and then also there is a children's bulletin that's available in the back, Tim. Yeah, children's bulletin that's available in the back. Has some things for today's worship service, uh, but also could be used throughout the week. There's some things there too. So those are available to us. Uh, let me pray for us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the order of those things. Let me pray for us and the Weldon family will come forward uh, and light our first Advent candle and give us our reading. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the many blessings that we have received. So Father, we ask now that you would enable us through your spirit, that you would enable our mind and heart to worship you as your people. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Weldons. One, one through five. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Mark 1, 14 through 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Why do we light the first Advent candle? We light the first Advent candle in anticipation of the promises of God that are fulfilled with the coming of the Messiah. We light this candle as a symbol of exaltation to our great God who has redeemed his people. The King has come, his kingdom 
is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Thank you, Weldons. Please stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship comes from Romans chapter 11, verses 33, into chapter 12, verse 2. I'll read the light print. Please respond with the bold. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How inscrutable His ways. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, for our affirmation of faith today, we will read uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, section 8.4, and the larger catechism, questions 51 to 52. And since in section 8.4 begins with a reference to this office, it says, this office the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake. To 
choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, head and savior of his church, heir of all things, and judge of the world. Therefore, this office refers to that entirety. He is the mediator. He is the prophet, priest, king, head and savior of his church, which is us. He's the heir of all things and the judge of the world. And so today's affirmation of faith, we're reminded again that in order to take on this office, Christ would leave his father's side, eternal side, humble himself to take on flesh, live in a difficult and fully righteous life, suffer humiliation and anguish, die on a horrific yet glorious cross, and be separated fully from his father for three days before raising himself up, defeating death, rescuing his people, and returning to the side of his father in full glory. This office did not come cheaply. Uh, so as we read this, um, just, just remember, um, I don't think we really uh, comprehend how grand what he's done is. So I will read section 8.4, and then I'll read the questions, if you will please respond with the answers. This office the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake, which that he might discharge, he was made under the law, and did perfectly fulfill it, endured most grievous torments immediately in his soul, and most painful sufferings in his body, was crucified and died, was buried, and remained under the power of death, yet saw no corruption. On the third day he arose from the dead, with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world." What was the estate of Christ's exaltation? How was Christ exalted in his resurrection? Praise be to God. Our prayer of confession today focuses on our inability to truly comprehend Jesus for who he is. Uh, let's pray together and then we'll have a time of silent personal confession. Please join me. Jesus, our only king, we praise you for being the one who was willing to lay down your life on the cross and who was raised by your own power through the resurrection. Lord and Savior, we confess that we fail to grasp that your work alone satisfies God's wrath and justice. It declares your true power as the Son of God and has power over all the living and the dead. We fall into unbelief over who you are, Jesus. We fall into unbelief thinking that our deeds and works can make us right with you. We fall into unbelief by trying to find hope and joy within ourselves. Loving Savior, we confess our sin and rest alone by faith on these gospel promises that are fulfilled for us by Christ's humiliation and exaltation. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, these things are true. We are so broken. We so quickly fall into the unbelief, into the ignorance that it is about us, not about you, that we can save ourselves, that our works are what define us. Lord, that uh, we don't need you. And yet, Father, you have shown us uh, the glory of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to be humiliated, to suffer and to die in order that broken people like us might have a Savior, might have a way. And so, Father, would you help us? Lord, would you just remind us constantly that Christ lived for us the life we couldn't live and we don't live daily. And he died for us, the death that we all deserve. Father, would you help us and would we just, would joy emanate, not sorrow, not guilt, Lord, but would joy emanate from that and thanksgiving, that we would live lives of great joy, great thanksgiving to you, and that we would share uh, your beauty with others. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name, amen. Our assurance of pardon today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now join together in singing Fullness of Grace. For today's pastoral prayer, we will be praying for uh, Beth Thomas and James and Chestnut and their children uh, in, our fa- in our IPC family. We'll be praying for Stetson Baptist Church as our neighbors, and we'll pray for the nations, uh, Paris, France, and Joel and Stephanie Swanson, um, our missionaries in France. So if you'll please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, just so thankful that you have made a family uh, here at Emmanuel in the land. Father, we thank you for the family you have built. Uh, We thank you this morning, particularly for Beth Thomas. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for just uh, so much about her, uh, her encouragement and love to those around her. Lord, for her passion for children's ministry, uh, ongoing endurance there and service, Uh, for her unwavering love for her children and her grandchildren. And Father, just for her wonderful spirit and endurance uh, in the life that you have given her. Lord, I pray for, for her, we ask you, 
uh, that you would maintain her health, that you would sustain her, you would support her, you would continue to provide uh, physical ability and mobility uh, as she uh, continues uh, to, to serve you. Father, in her work, would you enable her to continue to be a blessing to the young people that she works with? Uh, would you enable her to show them grace and mercy and love uh, from you, uh, as well as righteousness? Lord, would you change hearts through her work? Uh, also, would you enable her to be a powerful uh, and constant presence in her grandchildren's lives, Lord? Uh, Patrice and Arthur, Lord, would you help her daily, weekly to share the gospel with them. Father, for her spirit, preserve her, give her joy beyond measure uh, for your salvation in her life. Encourage her each day with new mercies. Would you be her rock and her fortress, uh, her unmoving foundation in times of trouble. And Lord, for James and Chesna, uh, we pray that you would continue to pursue them. Lord, would you pursue their hearts and their lives. Would you help them to hear and rest in and live out the gospel? Father, please pursue them. Lord, would you please provide them provision and peace uh, within their marriage and outside of their marriage? Would you bless their relationship, uh, give them strength, uh, enable them to be uh, sacrificially lovers of one another, to uh, care more for the other than themselves? Lord, would you give them the ability uh, to live uh, out, would you give them the ability to love their mom and be thankful? Uh, Father, would you guide them in their parenting, uh, parenting of Patrice and Arthur? Grow them, enable them to teach their children by word and by example uh, how to live as becomes a follower of Christ. Lord, we just bless this Thomas family. Father, for Stetson Baptist Church, uh, Reverend Dan Glenn and his staff, uh, Father, I pray first for them, for, the, for your uh, leaders there, that you would hold them fast to you. Lord, that you would remind them, show them their sin. They are sinners. Lord, would you help them to live lives not demonstrating righteousness only, but Lord, demonstrating repentance, helping others to see how to live uh, in the face of a, of a Savior. Lord, we need a Savior. And so would you grow these men, show them how to show repentance, make them truly repentant, give them humble hearts, help them to point their congregation, their people, your people, Lord, uh, to Jesus. Father, would you bless your people at Stetson Baptist? Uh, would you enable them to live consistent lives, uh, lives that demonstrate, again, humility, love, compassion for their neighbors? Lord, would you help them to spread the gospel uh, in their neighborhoods, in their friendships, in their workplaces, and, Father, even to the extents of the end of the world? Lord, we pray that you would continue to preserve uh, your family there, bless them each day. And then, Father, lastly, we pray for Paris, France. Uh, Lord, um, in the times I get to speak to Stephanie or hear from Stephanie's prayer requests, uh, France, uh, Lord, it's desolate. Uh, Lord, your spirit we know is present uh, and yet uh, not as visible as we wish, as I know you wish, not as, as overt and present. Um, and so, Father, we just pray for the city of Paris, Lord, that you would cause a reawakening there, that you would show people that they're sinners, Father, the need of a Savior is what we need to know. And so, Father, would you, would you just do that? And we pray for, for Joel and for Stephanie that you would give them perseverance, that you would encourage them, that you would give them, uh, even this week, Lord, one encouragement, Father, um, a response from a person who has formerly denied you that would say, I love Jesus, I need Jesus. Father, would you do this, not for them, uh, but, Lord, for your people, that the angels would rejoice in heaven at the salvation of one person, Lord, you encourage them. We pray for them as parents as they uh, serve and grow uh, Pascal, their son. Lord, would you uh, enable them to share the gospel richly and beautifully with him as he grows. And uh, as we've prayed for others, Lord, that you would enable them to live lives of humble service, of humble gratitude towards you. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please stand as we now sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for this week. We thank you for this month. We thank you for this year. We thank you that even in the difficulties, you are near. Father, we're thankful because you have entered into our world and entered into our lives to redeem us and to restore our relationship to you in Christ Jesus. And because you have done this great work, because you have filled us, because you have made us new, oh, Father, would you work in our hearts that our hearts would overflow with gratitude and generosity. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for the doxology. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. We begin a series, an Advent series. Uh, our first uh, lesson, if you will, our first sermon, if you will, uh, we will begin in the, the uh, Gospel of Luke this morning. So our sermon text this morning is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 25, and then we'll skip forward to verses 57 through 66. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 25, and then 57 through 66. Let's give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and um, useful word. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, and just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, 
It seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he, he was serving as priest before the Lord, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Behold, and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remaining mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when He looked on me to take away my reproach from among people. Verse 57, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. She bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, Now of your none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted to, him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that your word is given to us. It is a gift from your hand. Your word is given to us to teach us, to instruct us, to train us in righteousness. But your word is a saving word. Your word is given to us to bring us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to rest on him as our only hope of salvation. And so, Father, we pray now that you would enable your spirit to work in us and among us, that we would learn and grow and be able to see and understand your word. 
And that, Father, it would strengthen our faith if we were in Christ. And if we're not in Christ, it would bring us to faith. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Moments. Our lives are marked by significant moments. Significant events, accomplishments often mark the high points of our lives. Right? One of the difficulties of 2020 has been the cancellation of significant events. Graduations, weddings, births. Not canceled, just not able to celebrate in the same way. Promotions, anniversaries, many other events that mark our lives have been altered by the global pandemic. Significant events give us guidance. They are a mooring, if you will, as we navigate the uncertainty of life. In our passage today, there are two significant events. One event is personal and objective, and the other is cosmic and spiritual. One is easy to see, and the other must be revealed. Imagine, if you will, an event that would be the defining moment of your life. An event that aspired you to dream, but its fulfillment was outside of your immediate control. The performing artist may dream of singing, dancing, or performing on a world's greatest stage. But it takes time to achieve that goal and in most cases, opportune circumstances to make it a reality. Young athletes dream of competing at the highest stage of their sport. Not only competing, but taking and making that winning shot, that winning goal, that winning catch, that winning stroke, that winning stride. There are pinnacles of recognition that we pursue in our careers, right? Events that we assume will define our success or our failure. Perhaps an acceptance speech for a new job, new role, or award. What are the events that you are dreaming of? What events do you imagine will be the defining moment of your life? Or as you reflect back, you look back as the defining moment of your life. What was that epic moment? Your 15 seconds of faith. As we will see in our story, this was Zachariah's moment. His career as a priest would be defined by being selected to burn incense in the temple. This was literally a once-in-a-lifetime honor and experience. As verses 1 through 4 remind us, the Gospel of Luke is written, Luke is writing to his benefactor, Theophilus. Right? In keeping with the other Gospels, Luke is compiling his orderly account on behalf or on the basis of eyewitnesses. Luke is a historian of first order, and his Gospel will reveal his attention to detail, chronology, context, varying perspectives from the eyewitnesses that affirm and validate all these historical facts. But Luke is not gathering and writing for history alone. But so that the Christian faith of Theophilus and our faith may be grounded in great certainty. This year our Advent series will be focusing on the gospel narrative accounts of the birth of Jesus. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke introduce us to the events and witnesses surrounding the birth of Jesus, the Son of God, the promised Messiah. All of Christendom and even much of our secular world are familiar with the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. The story of the first Christmas is told by what? Focusing on Jesus, born in a major. His parents, Mary and Joseph, 
adoringly on hand. Cattle in the stall, shepherds, angels, wise men close by. For the non-Christian, these events are children's stories, tradition, myths, fables, and at best, historical fiction. For many Christians, we tend to focus on the events of the Christmas story and not their meaning. We tend to see the details, but fail to see the scandal. We tend to coo at baby Jesus in a manger, but forget that this babe is the Son of God, made flesh, the creator, the ruler, the sustainer of all things, the king of the universe. We desperately need to see Jesus. We need to understand that His miraculous and yet ordinary birth paves the way to His eternal purpose to redeem us from sin and secure a people to know and to worship God for all eternity. By God's grace, as we engage in these next four weeks, the reliable witnesses and their stories through the Gospel of Luke and Matthew Our faith will be strengthened to marvel at how the birth of Jesus marks the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promises of redemption that had been anticipated ever since the fall of mankind into sin in the Garden of Eden. It's a cosmic event. Jesus is the promised Son, the seed of Eve who will crush the head of Satan through his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Through the accounts of these reliable eyewitnesses, we gain a personal and intimate insight into the birth of Jesus and his truest identity. Notice in our text that although we'll discuss him in greater detail, we read that uh, we'll discuss in greater detail as we think about the wise men, right? Luke dates the story of the first eyewitnesses of Zechariah and Elizabeth in the days of Herod, king of Judah. Herod the Great ruled from 37 to 4 BC. One commentator says of Herod that he was capable. He was a military strategist and very capable as a military leader. He was an architect and builder and city planner. The temple of Jerusalem was rebuilt by him and by all accounts it was magnificent. He was a diplomat, always negotiating, always navigating the Greco-Roman world in his favor. But he was cunning and crafty as well. And as we will see, in a couple weeks, cruel. He had no problem executing any opposition to him. But see, Luke sets these events in the annuals of Greco-Roman history not only to increase our confidence of their historicity, but to show us that God is sovereign over history and is working out His purposes in real time and in real place. God's promise and God's fulfillment of His promise in His story of redemptive history and in the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth are intended to prepare God's people for the coming of the Messiah through the birth and the ministry of John the Baptist. We will look at our text today under those three headings, the heading of promise, the heading of fulfillment, and the heading of preparation. In verses 5 through 25, we see promise, right? We see great expectations in front of us. Zechariah was a priest. He was a country priest. He was from the hill country of Judah, verse 39. Although he, it was not mandated in the Holy Scriptures, Zechariah was married to a daughter of Aaron. Elizabeth came from the priestly tribe of Israel. 
Although we're not given their exact age, he refers to himself as an old man, refers to his wife and himself being advanced in years. What is clear from our text is both Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were beyond the age in which fathering and mothering newborn child would be expected. They may have been in their late 40s, 50s, or 60s. We learn that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous and blameless. No, they they were not perfect, but they sought to be faithful and to walk in the ways of the Lord. We also learn an area of great sorrow and an area of great shame. Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children. Like the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham and Sarah, Zechariah and Elizabeth were advanced in age and had lost hope of ever having a child. Like Sarah, like Rachel, like Hannah, a barren woman in the Old Testament was accompanied with sadness, emptiness, and shame. Although Luke makes it clear that the barrenness of Zechariah and Elizabeth was not a result of sin, right? They were righteous, but among their neighbors, there must have been rumors, or at least suspicions. Nothing cruel per se, but they often probably felt left out at times as people talked about their children, and they were tempted to doubt God's goodness to them, as children are a blessing from the Lord. As a priest, Zechariah was deeply familiar with God's law. He was well versed in the prophets. He knew in detail the writings of the Old Testament. He led and enabled God's people in worship and the offering of right sacrifices for sin to God. Zechariah was a priest from the division of Abijah. He was one of many priests who served in the temple. According to 1 Chronicles 24, the priesthood was divided into 24 divisions so that the priests served at the temple two weeks per year. As our story reveals, Zechariah was away from home serving God's people at the temple. Not only was Zechariah on duty, but he had been assigned the cherished role of burning incense before the Lord in the holy place. A priest was to serve in this role only once in their lifetime, and many never received that honor. The priest was chosen by lot, by by the hand of the Lord to serve in this role. He would enter the curtain that separated the temple courts from the holy place right before the holy of holies and to offer incense upon the altar of incense to begin and end each day. As a priest offered incense on the altar, he would pray before the altar to God on behalf of God's people. His prayer would be for the salvation of Israel. His prayer of supplication before Yahweh, their covenant God, would be that He would bring the promised Redeemer for the redemption of His people. Come, Lord Jesus, come. As the priest would offer incense on the altar, God's people would pray outside of the holy place and await his return so that he would join the other priest as they in unison would pronounce in the courts God's blessing on the people, that ironic blessing upon the people. This was Zechariah's moment. This would be the pinnacle of his priestly ministry. He was a faithful man and a faithful minister. He was away from home. Perhaps he longed to share with Elizabeth how God had bestowed upon him this great honor and privilege. Undoubtedly, Zechariah was filled with great expectation and the flood of memories and emotions as he entered the holy place to offer incense 
and to plead with God for the salvation as the crowds waited outside, awaiting His return. As he enters in, Zechariah is confronted with someone he didn't expect. Right? The angel of the Lord. The angel Gabriel is standing on the right side of the altar of incense, revealing his authority. Zechariah's excitement and expectations turn to fear. He is rightly troubled. And to the trouble of Zechariah, Gabriel speaks words of what? Grace, peace. Comfort. Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. This great proclamation, this proclamation reveals to Zechariah that Gabriel's presence was one of blessing and not condemnation and judgment. He was not to be afraid. God had heard his prayer. We're not told the content of Zechariah's prayer, but we are told that God had answered his prayer. And from Gabriel's proclamation, God had answered both Zechariah's deepest personal desire and his highest spiritual hope. God takes Zechariah's moment. Just when his greatest priestly expectations are being fulfilled, He makes them even greater. He fills and floods them with His faithfulness and His eternal purposes to do beyond all that Zechariah could ask or imagine. He is told that his prayer for a son or daughter to remove the shame of barrenness has been answered. He and his wife Elizabeth will have a son. And what? And he, will have, and, and he will bring you joy and gladness, and the whole community will rejoice at his birth. His prayer for the salvation of Israel would be answered through this coming son, John. As a faithful priest of Israel, Gabriel's proclamation would bring to mind the words of the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, and most of all, Malachi that foretold one who would come to prepare the way, to prepare God's people for the coming of the Messiah. Allow me to conjecture slightly. If you were to have asked Zechariah at this pinnacle moment in his priestly ministry, Zechariah, what's lacking? What would he have said? I think he would have said, I wish I had a son. And I long to see God's promises of salvation fulfilled. Through God's messenger, Gabriel, this is what the exact message is to Zechariah. This is what he receives. I will remove your barrenness and prepare my people for the coming of my son through the birth of your son, John. To this great proclamation, to these great promises, how does Zechariah respond? Zechariah's expectations are too small. Zechariah was content with a moment when God was promising eternity. Zechariah was limited as he considered his capacities and physical weakness and was unable to rest in the power and the resources of God to accomplish his purpose and to fulfill his promises. Zechariah's faith is faltering. Zechariah's faith, he responds to this proclamation, to these promises in unbelief. He does not believe the words of God because what is being promised, Zechariah knows he's incapable of producing himself. It's not reasonable 
Old men don't have children. As C.S. Lewis rightly notes, in our sin we are far too easily satisfied. Like, like Zechariah, we are consumed by the moment or our pursuit of the moment. A moment that will not satisfy us for long or fill our deepest need and longing. Our moment is only, in our moment, we only consider the temporal, the here and now. We fail to ask and see, what is God doing that's even greater than what I can see in this moment? Like Zechariah, we falter. When God reveals to us His redemptive plans, purposes, and promises, often we don't believe that they are possible because we don't have the capacity to accomplish them ourselves. Our faith is not defined by God's capacities, but by our own. We have heard of Abraham and Sarah and how God gave them a son of promise in their old age. We have heard that God fulfills His covenant promises, but that was then, and this is now. You see, like Zechariah, our faith falters to believe God's promises are true. How does God respond to Zechariah? He responds in loving discipline. Zechariah's unbelief is met with a stern rebuke and loving discipline. Imagine the fear that must have consumed Zechariah. He was afraid upon seeing Gabriel, but as Gabriel rebukes him, he must have turned white with terror. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I speak for God. I dwell in His presence. You are rejecting God. And your life is in peril. Notice that God responds to Zechariah's doubt and unbelief with the grace of loving discipline. Due to unbelief, Zechariah is stricken mute. Perhaps he was stricken deaf, deaf as well. The original language has a broader semantic range than just mute. We also see in verses 22 and 62 that there were needs for signs to get Zechariah's attention to communicate. In silence, Zechariah would live unto the fulfillment of God's promise came to fruition. Zechariah leaves the holy place, joins the impatient and astonished crowd and completes his temple service. Upon returning home, God is faithful to his word. Elizabeth becomes pregnant. Her reproach of barrenness is removed. Zechariah remains silent. Look at verses 57 through 64 as we think about fulfillment. First, there's rejoicing. The birth of John was a community event. As the angel Gabriel had promised, his birth brought great joy to his parents and his neighbors. Notice the source of joy was what? Everyone recognized that the Lord had shown great mercy. The Lord had shown great mercy to Zechariah and Elizabeth by giving them a son, a child in their old age. There is a fulfillment of God's promise and of Gabriel's proclamation to him. Notice their obedience, right? How do they respond? They respond obediently. They have him circumcised on the eighth day. Now, there's this interesting thing in the text because circumcision did not carry with it naming a child. 
That actually was a Roman tradition to name the child later on, seven to ten days later. So it seems that they had taken in that tradition from the outside. So faithfully he was circumcised, and then there became this question of naming him. And everyone assumed, what would his name be? Zechariah, after his dad. And Elizabeth is emphatic. His name is to be John. And you hear the questions being asked, right? You don't have anybody in your family named John. Where did that name come from? Somebody get Zachariah's attention. And there's a writing tablet. And an interesting side, that was a tablet that was covered with wax. So like a giant, uh, an old etch-a-sketch. And so they would write on it and then wipe it out. And so obviously it's something that he had been using. And you see obedience at its climax is what? He writes, there's no, notice the difference in Zechariah. Notice how God had disciplined him and his faith and increase. And there's no questions. There's no, uh, let me tell you why. His name is John. Why? Because that's what God told me. There's this complete obedience that leads to what? Zechariah's restoration. Look at verse 64. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke. And what was the first thing he spoke? He blessed, blessing When Zechariah had first heard of God's promise and God's proclamation, he said, it's not possible. And now, because God had lovingly prepared him and disciplined him, he responds by what? Great faith in blessing God. Obviously, it's possible. And great fear falls upon the neighbors. And they begin to talk. And word begins to spread throughout Zechariah's parish. And all who heard laid these things up in their heart, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. You see, there's this restoration. And in this restoration, there's a preparation. There's a preparing God's people, right? The community is beginning to look and to see God is doing something in our day through this son, through this promised one to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Notice that as a priest, Zechariah had not been teaching them. He was silent. God had stricken him that way. But God was preparing people for something that He was doing and revealing to them at this time. They respond with great wonder. They respond with fear. They respond with bearing witness to other people. And they respond with a heart being prepared. Being prepared for repentance and the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God. How will you respond? How will I respond to the word of the Lord? How will you respond to the word of the Lord today? Like and through Zechariah's story, the word of the Lord is being proclaimed to us today. Do you believe? Do you hear the angel Gabriel's proclamation of good news? God has prepared the way of salvation from sin apart from the law by sending His own Son to die for the sins of His people. Do you believe? God has given a son to Zechariah and Elizabeth to fill their barrenness and shame and at the same time fulfill His redemptive purposes from all time in sending the forerunner to prepare His people for the coming of His Son. Do you, do I, believe? God has taken Zechariah's personal moment of greatness and made it greater 
by revealing its cosmic and spiritual significance. Do you believe? How do your dreams and moments of greatness need to be refined and defined by the Lord? Are you willing by faith to rest in the word of the Lord? Are you repenting of your sins, of your unbelief, and by faith relying on the work of Christ? Do you believe? John's ministry of preparation is a ministry of revelation and a ministry of repentance. As God reveals to you, to me, our unbelief, as He reveals our self-reliance, as He reveals our rebellion against God, how will we respond to His gracious gift? of repentance. Do you believe? In loving discipline, God silenced Zechariah for a season to strengthen his faith. Where are you? Where do you need to be graciously disciplined by the hand of the Lord? Where do your, does your faith need to be refined and strengthened? Where are your plans, your mo- moments, usurping God's promises, God's plans, and God's purposes? In a moment, I'll read in closing Luke 1, 60, 67 through 80. These are Zachariah's words of response. Zachariah's faltering faith explodes into blessing God and worshiping Him because he has experienced God's gracious gifts of repentance and faith again and anew. The ministry of preparation to which John the Baptist was called, for which Zechariah and Elizabeth were to prepare him, was also needed in the heart of his mom and dad as it is also needed in our heart. Do you believe? Are you ready to see and to receive Jesus? How is God preparing you? What is God revealing to you about your heart and about your sin as He reveals things to Zechariah? How is God preparing you? Where is God calling you to repentance and faith? How is God preparing you? Where do you need to be restored? There's this great beauty because Zechariah is fully restored, is he not? Fully restored because what? Even better and greater than before because his barrenness has been filled. And God's salvation is at hand. How is God preparing you to rejoice? After ten months, nine months of silence, Zechariah's first words, bless the Lord. And then it explodes in verse 67 into Zechariah's song. Listen to all the fullness in closing of Zacharias' song to the Lord. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited and redeemed His people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High For you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet 
in the way of peace. Zechariah gets it. Do we? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, your witnesses. We thank you for the witness of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Father, we thank you for your promises, uh, redemptive promises that are fulfilled and your promise to give them a son. And at the same time, you are fulfilling their barrenness and brokenness and shame. And Father, that is what we need you to do in our lives as well. Grant us the faith to say yes and amen, to rest and believe in your promises, to know that they are true, to know that they are certain, to know that they are life-changing and life-altering because your Son came into the world to save sinners. And we know this to be true because you sent John the Baptist into the world as a forerunner and preparer of the Messiah who is yet to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as we now sing, Lift Up Your Heads. glad that you're with us this morning. If you're visiting, welcome and thank you for being with us. If you have questions, whether you're a visitor, regular attendee, or a member here at Emmanuel, if you've got questions, you want to know more and understand more about the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'd love to have that conversation. I'll be in the parking lot and would love to greet you and begin that uh, conversation or set an appointment for that conversation. But the person next to you would also love to bear witness as that crowd, as the crowds left at the birth of Elizabeth and uh, at the birth of John to Zachariah and Elizabeth, bearing witness, so those next to you would also bear witness to the goodness of Christ. And so let's do that with one another. Uh, as Zachariah came out of, from behind the curtain of the holy place, mute he would have pronounced this benediction with the priest. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. 
The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.